podcast. I'm Lisa Rodocker in the admissions office at WNL. We're really glad that you could join us here today. We hope that you're all doing well. Um, we are uh, really appreciative of Ms. Hilton from the Office of Career Strategy and Professor Weiss, uh, who is a member of our faculty clerkships committee um, in their work today and bringing together this wonderful group of alumni, panelists, recent graduates. Uh, to talk about their experiences with clerkships, which is definitely um, something that uh, you may want to consider as you're approaching law school. Thank you um, very much. Hi, everybody. Thank you for taking some time on what might be a beautiful day wherever you are, or a too hot day wherever you are, um, to join us for this sort of special subject matter uh, Zoom. So. I know that you received information about the panelists, um, so I'm not going to take up time with reintroducing them other than um, to let you know that I've asked them to um, change their screen name to a combination of their first name and their court, so you'll be reminded of who is, is where or who has been where or who is going where. Um, in case you want to direct questions uh, to individual panelists later on in the hour. Um, so let me start by saying that um, I wear a, a bunch of hats on calls like this. I went to Washington Lee and I practiced law for about 15 years, including a two-year clerkship at the beginning of my career. Um, and I've been back as an administrator for more years than I will admit. Um, so I've had pretty much every, <laughs> you know, every viewpoint on the institution. Um, so I sort of meandered into a postgrad clerkship and um, have taken an interest in supporting students who are interested in that position uh, as long as I've been back as an administrator. Um, based on my personal experience of what a great experience, uh, professional experience it has been, and the fact that I have never spoken to anyone who didn't highly recommend it as, as a professional experience, and um, truth be told, you know, holds some secret desire to go back and be a law clerk again. So um, I, I hope you're smiling, Professor Weiss, because <laughs> you, you had many, many clerkship experiences. So. So let me talk a little bit about um, clerkships at, and the support uh, we offer for clerkship aspirations at Washington and Lee, and then we'll move to the experience of the panelists and the, um, the support of the faculty clerkship committee. So within the Office of Career Strategy, I specialize in clerkship advising, um, which includes to some extent um, summer judicial internship advising. Um, and uh, I work with students as early as they wish to start talking about um, a, a potential clerkship as a postgrad position. I should say, um, though most of you or many of you may already know this, um, clerkships are fairly consistent, but not, not uniformly consistent. Um, they're postgrad positions in judges' chambers, usually for a single judge sometimes for a panel of judges or a group of judges who sit on a certain court, um, most often for a year, um, almost as often for two years. Um, and in some cases, um, judges have what they call career clerks, which is a job like every other job, a job you keep until you decide to leave and go get another job. It's just not a job with a, a defined end date when you accept it. Um, so we do everything from informational um, programming at the law school to individual conversations between students and faculty members or students and OCS advisors, students who have been in chambers in, um, in summer positions or in postgrad positions. Um, on occasion, we have roundtable luncheons with judges who are on campus to judge moot court or to do other things. Sometimes the Fourth Circuit hears arguments at Washington Lee. And if they are willing, we put them with students to the extent they're, they're available to do that. So there's lots of information about clerking available to you on a fairly regular basis once you come to campus. Um, the application process itself doesn't start until um, sometime in your second year, depending on the court, it may be a bit earlier, but for most students, 
it gears up through second semester and applications are about to um, land in federal judges chambers and some state courts um, this month. And then the process continues throughout third year based on the preferences of individual courts around the country. So one of the best things about being a judge is that you pretty much do things exactly the way you want to do them. And that means you can do them in February of students 2L year or February of students 3L year or anything in between or anything after. Um, so it, it is not a, a, um, an application process that is strictly that has strict parameters. So one of the best things you can do to prepare for the clerkship application experience is, uh, you know, internalize the idea that it's kind of a crazy quilt, and um, and you're going to have to make um, some best guesses about what you want to do and where you want to be. All that makes it sound like everybody in this call applied for clerkships for 10 or 12 months and underwent a long and rigorous you know, process. And as I'm looking at the faces, some of these people interviewed exactly one time <laughs> and they got the job, right? Um, so, um, so I don't wanna to talk too long, but that hopefully gives you an overview. Um, and I'm gonna ask Professor Weiss to speak a bit about the role that the, the members of the faculty clerkship committee play in assisting students um, in preparing for clerkship applications and interviews. Great. Right. Hey. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so I am a member of the clerkship committee, which I love because I spent a lot of years working in courts, all federal courts. Uh, so clerking is very near and dear to my heart, and I love helping students and preparing students for the process of um, applying for clerkships. So um, what we do is we just, you know, help you through the entire process from discussing interests that you might have. Maybe you're on the fence. You're not sure if you want a clerk. You do want a clerk. Um, or if, you know, if you, you're looking for, um, you know, like kind of, ideas for where you think you might want a clerk or a, you know the type of court that you might want a clerk for where you know we're available at that very beginning stage where you're just thinking about the possibility through every step of the application process what you need to do um, how you get your materials together what is required what a cover letter should look like um, Ms. Hilton in um, Career Services also is very involved in this, um, and everyone else in Career Services is very involved, but, but we are as well. Um, so, you know, through, you know, that process of getting your materials together, then um, you apply, and if you uh, receive any interviews, we provide mock interviews for you so that you can practice um, interviewing and what that experience would be like, uh, and of course, each judge is different, so you don't know exactly what you're going to get in an interview process, but we provide some uh, mock interviews for you to practice your interviewing skills, and, um, and then we rejoice with you and celebrate when you get your clerkship. So we really are there with you every step of the way, um, and we are all very committed to having students apply for clerkships and get clerkships, so you have a lot of support at WNL. Thank you. Um, it occurred to me as Professor Weiss was speaking that that one of the things I'll I'll um, I'll mention is you know clerks can be at at state court or at federal court. They can be in courts with specific jurisdictions like bankruptcy court or tax court. They can be with judges who are hearing trials and with judges who only hear appellate arguments. And so. The clerkship experience on a day-to-day -day basis can be very different from one court to another. So when Professor Weiss was talking about um, beginning a conversation with you individually about what you are, your interest in clerking, um, there are some decisions to be made. Maybe you're interested in a clerkship, any, anyone you can get, and I would be totally behind you if that's the way you feel. But oftentimes, um, you might be 
interested in a career as a litigator. And so you will find a trial experience much more um, of a seasoning um, position where you're just going to see motions argued and witnesses examined and cross-examined, as opposed to reading a court record and watching oral arguments on the assignments of error. Um, so there's a fair amount of variety within the category of clerkship experience, um, and that's something that we encourage you to consider um, early on, um, and, be, and, and you'll find your own level of flexibility. Um, there are usually more than one court. <laughs> There's usually more than one court that will fit your bill. So, um, so our, our alum panelists fall into two very general categories. Um, some are very recent alums, like a month, and have yet to start their clerkship experience. And some have been clerking for a while. Um, and we have one person on the call who practiced law at a law firm for a while and left that position to go clerk, and it is fairly early in that clerkship experience. So let me ask the, the most recent grads, Hannah and Diana, uh, to speak a little bit about how they came to their decision to apply for clerkships and what that experience was like. Do you want me to go first? I can go first. You are unmuted, Hannah, so you just <laughs> go on. Perfect. Um, I did not know I wanted to do a clerkship or had any interest in clerking until I took statutory interpretation with Professor Hasbrook and he sat me down and told me the entire semester that I needed to clerk. And I kept saying, no, like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. My grades aren't going to be good enough. Like, I'm not going to do a clerkship. Um, and then I ended up doing pretty well at the end of my second year. So I was like, oh, no, what do I do? So I, I kind of got into the process pretty late, like a little bit too late for a federal clerkship. Um, so I just kind of moseyed around, um, didn't really know what I wanted to do until Ms. Hilton sent me an email saying, hey, Professor Klein has this connection with this judge in Maryland. Like, what do you think? Like, are you interested? The best part was like during that entire time, I was out with the flu. So it was a great experience. I was like only moderately coherent when talking to Professor Klein to learn more about this judge. Um, and I was really interested in Maryland because that's where half of my family is from. And I just did the DC semester and I got to spend so much time with them and it was just an absolute blast. Um, so by the time I actually got my interview with this judge, like after sending in all my material, I just asked the judge, like I didn't really know what to expect. And then like we talked about ice cream and Chipotle, like we just really connected. Um, and then I realized, okay, I would like to work for her for a long time. I mean, my clerkship is only for a year, but I'm, I'm really excited. Okay, so Diana, your experience is a bit different, but maybe not so different. <laughs> yes, so um, I too, I didn't know that I wanted to clerk up until almost the, like maybe the month before I started applying. So um, I always thought, you know, I'd go to law school and then end up working at a law firm. And that was pretty much where I saw myself. But um, I didn't end up getting into the, the big law firms for the summer associates. And um, when I spoke to find out how I could, I spoke to al alumni to find out how I could enter into bigger law firms. And she told me that one of the best ways would be to clerk and then uh, go from clerking into the law firm when they're hiring next. At the time, I thought, I, I, I don't want to clerk. <laughs> I don't want to do that. And so I was trying to figure out other ways. And um, my second year summer position, I ended up clerking for a judge uh, in my hometown. So it was just like a five minute drive every day. And so when I was at that job, I was able to see what clerks do and how much they do and the variety of work that they do. And after I, um, finished that job. I also didn't want to click. I said, it's too much. I don't want to do it. And then, um, so I was trying to figure out what I was going to do after I graduated. If it's law firm, is it something else? I, I wasn't too sure. And then um, one of my favorite professors at the law school, she's a bankruptcy judge, and her um, law clerk reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to clerk for um, after I graduate. And at the time, I was hesitant. I took 
two days to think about it. I, he emailed me on about on Saturday or so, and then Monday I thought of, by by Monday I thought about it and I decided yes, I actually do want to clerk for this specific judge. I loved her class. I I know I, I learned so much working for her in the bankruptcy court, but by Monday I was too late and she already hired somebody else. And I guess it was the rejection that took me knowing I actually do like this, I actually do want to clerk. And so then I started applying for um, clerkships in um, my area of where I live. I live in Connecticut. And then uh, I applied for a few federal clerkships, maybe three, four. And then I applied for uh, one state clerkship, which is what I ended up getting. Luckily, it's but now I'm applying for um, more questions, and that that that's not the process. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to jump in here to mention um, one of the ways in which the clerkship application process is different from from certainly law firms and almost all other post grad legal jobs is that when you're offered the job, the first offer you get, you say yes, and you tell all the other judges to whom you've applied that you need to withdraw. Um, that's what judges expect. Um, that's, what we, that's what we advise as, a, as an institution, um, both to assist you in maintaining your reputation because there, there's, you don't want a judge angry with you. You don't want a judge who's, who believes that you, you somehow didn't understand the rules and, and those are the rules as, as judges have set them. So, so one of the things, in addition to it being a kind of a crazy quilt of application timing, one of the things you have to prepare yourself is that you're not going to be able to comparison shop between the clerkships that you um, are offered. You, you won't be able to, to say, well, this is pretty good unless I get that. Um, and so you, you need to get your head around that process from the beginning. Um, because it, it's really hard to get your head around it at, at any other time in the process. It comes, it comes in hard and fast if you, if you are not prepared for that early on. Um, so, so students on occasion will interview for positions and, and not receive the offer. But if you do receive the offer, um, the answer is yes, even though some judges do give you a day to think about it. Um, and, and you don't get to find out whether you would have gotten some of the positions that are, would perhaps have been more attractive to you. So, so the importance of um, refining your strategy fairly finely um, on the way in um, is an important one. So, all right, so let's flip to the other group who, who's been clerking for a while and hear, um, Anything, anything um, that you want to add on the application experience, certainly, but, but more about the experience of being a law clerk. I'm okay. not going to call on you, so. I'll go first. Okay. So, I mean, so far my experience has been pretty wonderful and I consider myself extremely lucky to land where I did. Um, it's kind of like you said, you can only do so much research on a judge beforehand and there's only so much available online and you can only gain enough fit um, in a few hours in a, of an interview. And I really, really lucked out where I'm someplace that I'm absolutely supposed to be. Um, and I love working with Judge Lawson every day. So that is just wonderful. And my other experience is just, I love that it's such an academic job. Everything that I've work on pretty much every day I've literally never seen before or we had a cursory review in class where we read like two or three cases in um, federal jurisdiction so most of what I do I have no idea what any of it means and I'm having to take a very humble approach and really do a deep dive on Westlaw every single day which is fun and like I so appreciate that experience because you really Maybe this is something Kendall can speak to, but when you're in a law firm, you can't exactly bill like three hours reading law review articles on qualified immunity. You just can't do that. Um, but in my job, in my role, I have to approach an issue from every angle. So I really have the time to do whatever I want. And with that, the other side of it is also just having access to a judge and being able to have candid 
um, casual conversations about my feelings on legal issues, which I will, you'll never get as a practicing lawyer. You'll never have that access and you won't be able to, um, see their candid response and what they find persuasive and not. Do you have a, a co-clerk, Kelly? So Judge Lawson is a senior judge. And so he only has two clerks and it's me and his career clerk. And while we're on the topic of applications, I can speak um, a little bit if I'm not interrupting you, Kelly. No, go ahead. Okay. Okay, perfect. Um, so my experience was very different. Um, I uh, practiced law for about a year and a half before um, even applying to clerkships. Um, it had always been something I was interested in. I majored in English in undergrad and then um, in my first year of law school, first semester, um, like first class, uh, we submitted a memo in legal writing and my professor suggested that that I should um, look into clerking and it was something that I might like, um, given that I liked writing and, and I guess given the way um, that I saw things. Um, and so I thought about it and was very interested in it um, and kind of was working towards applying for clerkships. And then um, I also was applying for big law jobs and kind of when I got my job at a firm, um, clerking fell to the wayside a bit because I wasn't convinced that I wanted to litigate. And oftentimes, if you want to be a litigator, you clerk. And if you want to be a transactional attorney, um, you know, it, it, people think it doesn't um, make as much sense to do that. Um, so I was kind of like, you know, I got the job that I wanted. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and go forward with this and put my um, kind of put my focus on this. So as I mentioned, I practiced for about a year and a half uh, doing securities and capital markets work. And, um, you know, I had always kind of thought that the partner track wasn't what I was, you know, made for or anything like that. Um, but um, as I kind of went along, I realized that I really missed the writing aspect um, of my work. You know, I would write internal memos every once in a while, but writing was kind of what drew me to law school, what propelled me through law school. And then, um, you know, kind of going into a practice area where it's not very um, writing intensive at all. Um, you know, I thought clerking could be something that would fill that void. Um, and so I actually just kind of stumbled upon this um, through the Young Alumni Network. There was a posting um, that I got via email um, for a uh, open position in Charleston. And um, it was posted by an alumni who graduated in 2015. And she was the current clerk. Um, and she was actually moving to a permanent position, not as a clerk for the judge, but as a um, staff attorney. And so I called her to ask a bit about the position and kind of what she was doing, um, what her day to day looked like to see if it was something I would enjoy. Um, and she said, you know, my day to day is pretty much research and writing. Um, there's not a lot of in court stuff that we deal with, um, at least in, in her role as a term clerk. And so I decided to apply um, and all the same kind of materials, you know, cover letter, resume, writing sample, letters, recommendation, references, and all of that stuff. Um, and then I went down to Charleston, probably like two months later and um, interviewed for the position. And then it took, I think it took like another two months and um, I got the call from the judge in early April. So I just started uh, mid April in the middle of uh, the pandemic. So I've been working remotely the entire time, which has been, you know, totally fine. Um, and I've actually really enjoyed that. But um, so far, it's been wonderful. And uh, to Kelly's point, you know, it's really nice to kind of connect with um, a judge so well and to just enjoy working for um, that person because there's a lot of contact. But I would agree, um, too, that it's really nice to be able to spend as much time as you need to researching something. Um, it's very different than my previous practice area. So everything is new to me. Uh, we do a lot of employment, uh, civil rights stuff, 
And, um, you know, I don't have any background in that. So it's nice to be able to take a deep dive in Westlaw and not be charged for, you know, everything that's outside of your Westlaw subscription and then have to justify that and why you're billing it to a client and all of that stuff. Um, so, so far it has been great. Okay, Jay, or Ben seems to be off camera and we know it's his first time with Zoom, so I don't know what to think about that. Let's, you go, Jay. <laughs> Jay there's, there he is. <laughs> He's back. Oh, well, so either of you, but Jay, when you take your turn, whenever it is, um, you're the only person on the call who's clerked at more than one court, so I'd be interested in you contrasting those two experiences for us. Sure. I mean, I pretty much agree with, you know, what has been said by everyone so far. How I got my bankruptcy clerkship, which is what I'm clerking right now, is pretty odd in that. So I graduated in 2018, same as uh, Kendall, and I was just applying for you know, a bunch of clerkships through Oscar. And then I got an um, in-person interview invitation from the career law clerk for from Judge Santoro, who's the bankruptcy court that I'm, uh, bankruptcy judge that I'm clerking for right now. And I went in. And he actually had offered me a job on the spot, but I had to accept it right there and then. But then that position didn't start until 2020. But as Andrea said, you know, you don't say no to, no to the judges' offers when they give you one. So I immediately accepted the offer. And then so I had that one year of a gap period where I was in that sort of you know, limbo situation where I knew that firms wouldn't really like the idea of me you know, having just uh, worked at, work, uh, at the firm for a year and then go back to the clerkship. So I knew that I wanted to do a second clerkship. And so once I secured the bankruptcy clerkship two years out of my graduation, I applied to the state clerkships in Virginia Beach Circuit Court. And um, so that's where I started off uh, following my graduation for a year. And then I started my second clerkship in the bankruptcy court a year after that, which I started um, in August of 2019. So I have about two more months in this clerkship and then hopefully, you know, I'll end up uh, somewhere in Northern Virginia, DC area, which is where I'm from, I'm working at a firm. So in the state court, Jay, were you, mm -hmm. um, were you clerking just for um, a single judge or is that, that's a panel position? Yeah, it's actually like a panel, you know, sort of a process that we have. So there are eight circuit judges in the uh, Virginia Beach Circuit Court um, and there are three law clerks, three term law clerks, and one staff attorney, which is sort of equivalent of a career law clerk in federal uh, clerkship uh, process. So and among three of us, three law clerks, we would have about two to three judges. And I was assigned to two judges, Judge Fruji and Judge Lewis. And, and I'll be primarily assigned to um, those two judges and you know, whatever that they had uh, for that week. And I was sort of supporting, you know, sort of... Um, and do a lot of substantive legal research for them. So I had two judges that I primarily clerk for, but you know, any other judges can sort of come up to you and ask other questions, which you have to you know, sort of um, answer and so do whatever they ask you to do. So I will say, yes, I had two judges, but it's really up to you know, whatever the judges you know, wanted you uh, to do for that day. Okay, Ben, Court of Claims. Hey, yeah, I think I had a different application process. I think I remember applying to more, and you probably know something, but I had a more, uh, more applications generally. And I had a few interviews that were unsuccessful before I finally uh, landed a position at the Court of Federal Claims. But ultimately, I'm very grateful for it because I love working for the judge I'm working for now, and I love my co clerk. Um, it's just been a really good experience overall. Um, one thing that I found has been very beneficial looking back at it was uh, doing research on judges that I was applying to and looking to see if they had similar interests or they had a similar network that um, I could tap into. Um, so for example, I had interned at the Department of Justice Tax Division before and during my 2L summer. And I knew that I wanted to go back to the tax division after clerking. Um, and the judge I work for now was actually a part of the same 
trial section in the tax division that I had, uh, that I had interned at. So it turned out to be like a very good um, situation where I was able to uh, kind of maybe leverage my previous internship to get an intern to get an interview with him. But then also once I started clerking for him, he was able to turn around and give me a very good recommendation when it came time to apply for the Department of Justice Tax Division um, later on in the year. But correct me if I'm wrong, but before he did that, he asked you to stay for a second year, right? Yeah, so <laughs> um, we both, both my co-clerk and I had the option of a one or a two year clerkship. Um, he told me after I accepted the position, um, you know, definitely think about it and I won't be upset either way. He was very um, persistent to say, whatever, whatever you decide, I won't be upset. Um, but I definitely had to think a lot about it. And I knew my co-clerk was going to stay for two years. Um, and so then I felt less bad about ultimately deciding to stay for one year. But yeah, one day he just walked up to my desk and he said, well, what have you decided? And I kind of had to make a snap judgment. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Um, one of the questions that was submitted in advance of this session was about the, the benefits of clerking. And I think you all have touched on that um, a bit in the course of your remarks. Um, but I'd like to revisit a little bit. And, and I'll start um, by saying that it, it wasn't until I was finished clerking that I realized one of the things I learned the most about was how to be persuasive. And what was, what was the difference between an argument that you could make and an argument that you should make? Um, and a little bit about how to read your audience. I went into um, a non-litigation practice area. I went into transactional law after a clerkship, which as Kendall mentioned, you know, transactional lawyers think clerk clerkships are not as desirable um, as lit litigators tend to think they are. Um, but I maintain, and, and I'm also right on this, I will say, that, that they're wrong um, because, you know, one of the things clerking teaches you how to do is um, understand the value of an argument. And that is, it has direct applicability for all sorts of negotiations and other kind of day-to-day -day lawyering that happens in the transactional space, not just um, litigators who need to understand um, how to be persuasive and, and having a judge sort of debrief you at the at the end of a day in court about what was effective and what isn't is an experience that you cannot get any other way. Um, so so that's my two cents. I'd like to sort of go around Robin and see um, what other people think um, with about a year in, or in the case of Professor Weiss and and Jay, a couple of a couple of different clerkships to compare. Well, I think you kind of hit a major point that I've noticed is what kind of arguments are persuasive and what's not. And even if it's written really well and it's a big law firm and you've got the fanciest lawyers, you definitely pick up immediately on things that judges see through immediately. And you as a clerk, you will see through things immediately or you see things where I know they didn't spend very much time on this or they make one argument, but I know they really mean something else. Um, and so it's really taught me a lot about how to be a lawyer and what kind of lawyering that I want to do, especially from the neutral point of view that you have to be as a clerk. I've noticed um, what kind of lawyer I'm going to be and like had to think about myself in kind of a meta physical <laughs> sense. Um, <laughs> about what I'm going to do after my clerk and after my clerkship experience and thinking about, okay, I want to do like this lawyer, this is, he's doing great, or I don't want to make these kind of mistakes. Um, and then thinking about too, like what, how briefs come off and what, what um, level of professionalism that, that certain things might show. So I think I've had a good experience thinking about where I want to be from the angle of like, we can see everything. 
if that makes sense. There, there are a, a more opportunities than I ever anticipated for sort of modeling your own professional persona, right? You get to see, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, extremely effective lawyers that are just, it, it, though they may have a style that you cannot pull off personally, right? Um, but th there's a lot of information to be gained just watching lawyers practice law um, it, as you d sort of develop your own style and your own um, techniques. And, you know, there are things that you'll, you'll, you'll never do yourself, but they'll never surprise you. <laughs> right, because you you got to see them while right. you were a law clerk. Others? Yeah, I'll just jump in quickly. So um, I, uh, just as background, because I don't know if, if you all can see, but I just see Professor Weiss, Weiss Ninth Circuit. So I don't know if you can see, but... Um, That's all. Okay, so I, so immediately after law school, just as background, I clerked on the Ninth Circuit. So that's appellate federal court. Um, I was based in Portland, Oregon. My clerkship was for two years. And then I immediately went um, and clerked in the Eastern District of North Carolina. Very different style of court, also federal, um, for a magistrate judge there. And, you know, I've done other things. I, I worked for the Federal Public Defender Service. Um, and I taught, I taught law school, but then I also was a staff attorney in the Western District of Virginia doing um, legal work for um, the courts for pro se prisoner, um, on their pro se prisoner docket. So for all of the um, filings that come in from individuals who are incarcerated. Um, so that's just a little bit of history. I've, I've worked in a lot of different courts and one very big benefit is the um, networking opportunity and the people that I have met. You know, people have talked about their co-clerks, their judges. You know, my judge, uh, Judge Graber on the Ninth Circuit, she has a reunion every five years. So every five years I go out um, and, you know, I meet the new clerks. You know, now it's been many years since I clerked uh, there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm still, you know, the, the um, network from that clerkship is still extending because I have talked to so many clerks who I didn't personally clerk with, right? I mean, there were three of us uh, in chambers when I clerked and then, you know, some left. So it's a two-year clerkship rotating. So I clerked with a total of four other individuals. Um, and I, you know, people have done amazing things and really I have, um, you know, extended my network of people within the law, and that is really crucial. One, um, one person is a judge, one person who I, with whom I clerked is now a judge, and other people, um, you know, were our partners in law firms and other things. So I really have uh, kind of an extended group of people on whom I can rely, and that is, you know, an amazing bonus of clerking, in addition to just learning what it is that lawyers do, like how, you know, in law school, we give you a good idea in three years, but there, that is nothing compared to going into court every day, into the courthouse and seeing the motion, seeing the briefs, talking to the judge and really getting a hands-on understanding of how law is made. So um, I just wanted to highlight that. And on a similar note, I think for me, just from a professional development standpoint, I think getting true exposure to different areas of the law is really cool. So, you know, I guess maybe this is dependent on the clerkship, but um, for me, like we, I think I mentioned, I work for um, a magistrate judge as well. And so we deal with like a whole spectrum of issues from social security stuff to employment, to constitutional law, to prisoner rights cases and all kinds of stuff. And so I think kind of being able to get a better understanding outside of the academic spectrum of, you know, the day to day of different areas of the law is is really beneficial too. Yeah, kind of tagging on that point that Kendall just mentioned, you know, I mean, I'm, I work in the bankruptcy court, but you don't just work in the bankruptcy claims, right? You've got to consider all these state law related claims such as you know uh, 
so if a creditor files in a claim and a debtor objects to that claim, you've got to look at the substantive state law that's based in Virginia law. So you don't, you're not only having to work on the federal law, but also you have to be good at what the, what the state law says. So I think it's a sort of intersect of all kinds of areas of law. And that's a really been a great benefit of being a law clerk is that you're just exposed to so many various areas of law. And I think that gives you a huge leg up when you actually do practice, you know, law as a, as a young attorney um, working in a firm or, el or elsewhere. I think too, on that note, having to research and write on literally so many topics and having it to be absolutely perfect and correct, my confidence is really just shot through the roof with, with, front, with my lawyering. I just, I graduated in 2019 and thinking like, oh gosh, I know absolutely nothing. And now if I was to go work somewhere, I would feel pretty confident just taking whatever is thrown at me and feeling like I could tackle it. I'm just going to take a second and encourage the, the um, incoming law students. If you have questions, um, type them and put them in the chat. We're happy to address whatever is on your mind. Um, so I just want to take a minute and say that it seemed like someone was about to speak when I spoke over them. Was that you, Ben? Yeah, I was just going to say uh, being able to um, sit in the courtroom and for the most part, when you're clerking, it may be different for other people, but when a trial or a hearing is happening and you're the clerk in the courtroom, um, you typically don't have too many responsibilities. So it's a really good opportunity to kind of observe and just kind of take in how different parties are arguing, um, especially because you're typically you're sitting sort of from the perspective of the judge. So you're actually facing the party. So it's as a unique opportunity in that way. And then being able to talk to the judge afterwards and ask him how he felt about the argument or talk to other clerks who might have sat in and see what they thought about it. Um, I've always kind of been surprised because something that I would think was important. Um, sometimes the judge I work for is somewhat dismissive of and he'll get fixated on other things or other clerks will disagree and they'll think that one lawyer was better than the other or made a better presentation. And so not just being able to speak to the judges and get their opinions on things, but also talking to co clerks and seeing how they perceive um, filings and arguments being made is a pretty big advantage too. I don't I don't think any of um, any of the panelists is is uh, aspiring to be a, a, a criminal defense lawyer, but we did have a question it, that was submitted in advance about the applicability of a of a um, of a clerkship to someone who does want to um, to do defense. And I, I see Kelly smiling, and she I forgot completely, and we talked about it just today. Um, so uh, Kelly, jump in on this, because you, you are the aspiring federal defender. Oh, yes, that would be my dream job, but <laughs> federal defenders is like so impossible to get, but we'll, that's for another day. Um, so yes, uh, after my clerkship, I'm probably going to be applying to various public defender's offices or prisoner rights litigation groups and various public interest things. Um, my, a lot of people don't, a lot of organizations don't do prisoner's rights litigation and getting into 1983 is probably more than for today, but um, I'll end up applying for a bunch of public defender's jobs. Um, that's what I did during law school. But yes, my clerkship, because I'm at the trial court level, it's been really beneficial. Um, as Ben mentioned, during a trial, you're kind of sitting there right below the judge from the judge's um, vantage point. And one, I've gotten really good at the federal rules of evidence because during trials, I'll have my book of my evidence rules right in front of me. and if a dispute arises over an objection, judge might look down at me and ask me what I think and I'll have to run up um, and, and advise him on that. So that's one. Another is 
we deal with, we have a pretty big criminal docket. Um, we, um, so I, I do research on the sentencing guidelines pretty frequently and dealing with suppression motions fairly often. Um, I think the biggest part for me in what I've enjoyed the most is like what we've touched on before, seeing the wide breadth of practice. So when you're a criminal defense attorney or if you're a public defender, you might just see the one part of their criminal case where you're going to trial or um, doing a sentencing hearing. But from where I am now at the district court level, I get a whole wide range of criminal law issues. So whether it's the criminal case, the original criminal case, or we might have um, habeas, a habeas issue where a defendant feels like his conviction was unconstitutional, or we might have an immigration case where um, the, the, it's on a habeas again, but the person being detained feels like something in their immigration process was unconstitutional. And then of course we get the 1983 cases where someone is alleging that, um, for example, um, there was police misconduct in their arrest or they, or their, the um, conditions of confinement at the detention center are unconstitutional. So I've really appreciated getting to see really a holistic view of all the things that a criminal defendant might experience with their case, which you might not just get in your criminal, um, like as a public defender or criminal defense attorney. Now, Jay, correct me if I'm wrong, but your part of your docket in, in circuit court in Virginia would have been criminal. Right, correct? I would say about 40%, close to half, you know, it was a mix, uh, mix of uh, civil and criminal docket. So I would say about half of the docket was criminal. Um, so I pretty much got to see the same thing as uh, Kelly just described, a lot of suppression motions, um, you know, sentencing guidelines, but all of that in just a state level, uh, which I guess is a pretty much the same thing. It's just, uh, you know, state versus a federal. But we pretty much do, you know, from the uh, preliminary hearings to the, uh, the post-sentencing uh, motion. So we pretty much do, you see a whole wide array of uh, motions and, you know, uh, dispositive motions and even the trials of the criminal docket as well. So that was really helpful in the, in the state court for sure. In the bankruptcy court, not so much of a criminal activity is going on. <laughs> no. Unless it involves some of the DOJ or, you know, financial crimes that, that you're, you're involved in. But other than that, you know, there's really not much of the uh, criminal side of the uh, of the law in bankruptcy but st so state prosecutors are are sort of regular make regular appearances as a law clerk you would have basically a year to observe the folks who would ultimately be on the other side of a case from you and so when i think about advising students who say well should i want to do this i want to be a public defender mm -hmm. it's like well do you want a year of experience watching your opposition right. i would <laughs> right? right i would um so i i think sometimes the the most immediate um upside is getting to know your enemy in a, in a, in a daily way and understanding what the value of a case is because mm -hmm. you'll see the charging documents and you'll see what it settles for mm -hmm. and and my guess is that there's despite the heavy caseloads um, that that defenders have um, you're not going to see the volume of cases that you're going to see as a law clerk. So that one year of experience is going to be, you know, some some exponent of, of the number of cases you'd be able to mm -hmm. um, to handle. Um, and also, I I was a, a worked for the federal public defender. So I my clerkship um, my clerkship experience directly um, allowed me to work for the federal public defender. I worked in the appellate division, so that was following my appellate court clerkship. And I had, you know, understood and had seen what it was to write appellate briefs that are effective and to see what they um, entailed uh, and included. And that allowed me to get a position with the federal public defender for the Western District of North Carolina. But I just want to be clear that clerking positions you in a great spot for any job. I mean, I had been um, an appellate court clerk 
in Oregon, you know, on the Ninth Circuit, so dealing with law on the, the West Coast, federal law on the West Coast, and I worked for the Federal Public Defender for the Western District of North Carolina. It isn't as though I saw those particular litigants um, in the Federal Public Defender um, before or um, had experience with that area of law in North Carolina, but because I had these clerkships, people were interested in interviewing me and hiring me. And that is true of criminal law. That is true of transactional work. That is true of litigation. There is nothing that a clerkship will not position you in a great place for because to understand court culture judges what is effective in a courtroom and what is not is applicable throughout any area of the law. And so, um, you know, it did, it did help me for sure to pursue a career in criminal defense, but it would have equally prepared me for, um, you know, working in, in transaction work. And I, you know, I um, thought after my second summer that I might return to the big law firm that I had, um, you know, been a summer associate at, and I decided not to do that and to go a different way after, after clerking. So um, really, the world is your oyster. If you clerk, you have the opportunity to do a whole lot. I think that's absolutely true. Your resume, your resume is received um, entirely differently with a clerkship on it than yeah. it, it would have been um, the year before as a law student uh, without that credential. So I, I have a, qu a question that's been sent to me in chat. So let me present it to you panelists. Um, a few of you have said you are ambivalent or apprehensive or outright disinterested in clerking. And why is that? What, what were the downsides that initially um, threw you off? I could go first. Um, <laughs> um, so I, for me, I guess the main downside that threw me off to clerking initially was that I was just unfamiliar with it. I always thought that when you go to law school, from there, for the most part, you'll go to a law firm, even um, government jobs. I just, I was not familiar with it. So I thought low pay, like low everything. Like I, I, I didn't know what to expect. But the more I did my research is actually quite the opposite. The, the pay as well. You learn a lot, as everyone has mentioned. Um, it's really good credentials to for your resume, especially as you're beginning your career. And even just having my um, so that that was what made me want to uh, accept my two-hour summer clerkship internship. And then at when I was at that job, that's what even um, made me begin to realize more the value of clerkship and how important it is and what you learn. But then at that point, I thought that I didn't want to do it because I just wanted the, the law firm route. I thought if I'm, you know, I, I, I just, I, I wasn't sure how I wanted to begin my career. But now I've like switched and it, yeah, it's, it's a full 360 because now I do want to go ahead and even do more clerkships because of how valuable and beneficial it is. I think the other panelist who mentioned, you know, initially resisting the idea of clerking is, is Hannah Klo, who I, I think has hopped off. There is an anti-racism demonstration in Lexington today and it starts fairly soon and she let me know she'd be hopping off um, a few minutes early. Um, but let me speak for her because I, I worked with her during that process. I, I think she really wanted to get into the federal government. And she had had a DC uh, third year fall semester experience, as she mentioned. And during that, she applied to a, a number of federal positions. And they are very difficult to get as a law student, um, much easier as a as a uh, clerk. Um, so she uh, found herself in a position where a clerkship could ultimately advance her, um, her professional goal. And it came at a time when um, 
she was warming up to clerkships anyway. And she mentioned that Professor Hasbrook had leaned on her every day. And, and if you don't, if you have not met Professor Hasbrook on one of these other Zooms, um, trust me, that would be effective. <laughs> so, and it's effective when Professor Weiss does it. And it's effective when, when all of the uh, professors sort of take a personal interest in you and advocate for clerking. Um, the early invitations to this session might have mentioned that Professor Hasbeck was going to be on it. Um, he had a conflict with the protest I just mentioned. So he is on Main Street in Lexington right now or close to it. Um, but he asked me to make sure you knew that all the members of the faculty clerkship committee are accessible to incoming students. And if you'd like to get in touch with them, he is happy to speak with you, as would, as would um, any of the members be. Um, so, so I'm sure Hannah will forgive me for speaking for her. <laughs> is there anybody else who initially sort of resisted clerking? I don't, I don't think so. I think the rest of you were sort of on it. K Kendall, you were, you were sort of going on two roads until one of them <laughs> ended somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, and from that perspective, I'll just say, you know, um, it, it's like a lot when you're going through the process and I didn't know what I wanted to do with my legal career generally. And I didn't think I wanted to litigate, as I mentioned, public speaking is like my worst fear. And so I thought clerking was not going to advance me further than going to the big law job, you know, and in, in doing that. But I think in retrospect, um, you know, as we mentioned, that's not really true. Like there's this stigma that you don't need to clerk if you're going to be a tra transactional attorney. But I mean, even in leaving my firm, um, like everyone was very encouraging. Like when your clerkship ends, let us know, you know, just because this isn't furthering your substantive knowledge of securities, um, securities law, you know, we don't think this isn't, we still think that this is a valuable experience and we, you know, are happy to have you come back and bring that knowledge with you. Um, but I definitely think that no matter what, it's valuable. And I think pe even resisting it at first, sometimes it can be hard because everything's happening at the same time. Um, but I would just encourage everyone that as you get there and go through the process, um, it's definitely worth kind of the trudge through what sometimes seems like a, like an overwhelming process. It's definitely worth it. We are one minute before time. How's that for perfect? Congratulations, law clerks. You're very, very exact. <laughs> I just want to thank um, everyone, Andrea Hilton, uh, Professor Wise, and all of our participants today. I thought this was really helpful in taking a deeper dive into what clerkships are and the various opportunities and benefits of thinking about them. I think it sounds like from a lot of students, the more they learned about it, the better um, uh, they understood how well this could fit with their future career goals and how beneficial the experience is. So I think it's great that you all are considering this even before coming to law school so that if you want to pursue this as an option, you can really do so moving forward um, in good position. Um, again, thank you for your time today. And anything else, Ms. Hilton, before we go? No, thanks all for, for coming. And if you have questions, you, please do go through um, Dean Rodecker and let us know. We're happy to, happy to answer them as you, as you think about clerkships long term. Perfect. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank thanks you, for your time. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.